Hi, everybody. Welcome to Saddleback. You know, this weekend I'm continuing my tour of all of our campuses of the Saddleback Church. I want to say hi to all of our campuses and those of you who are joining us online. If you take out your message notes, we're going to begin a new series this weekend. You know, every Sunday in the United States, about 120 million people go to a church worship service. Now, let me put that in perspective. That means more people in America go to a church service on one single weekend, 120 million people, than will go and attend every single professional sporting event in America in an entire year. Now, today I wanna to ask the big question, why? Why do they do this? What are the benefits? Why are over two million, excuse me, two billion people around the world a member of a church family somewhere in the world? Why do they do this? What are the benefits? What's the payoff? Why get out of bed and go attend the service at a church when you can stay home? How would you answer that question? You know, having been a pastor for over 40 years, I happen to know that most people who attend a church service have no clear reason or idea why they're there. Uh, now, I, I'm sure that some of those millions who are attending church around the world, not just in America, but in, in Berlin and in Buenos Aires and in Hong Kong and in Manila and in all the other places where we're reaching out, I, I'm sure that some people attend out of habit or out of tradition, or maybe they go out of duty or they went to a church service out of guilt, or maybe they went because somebody pressured them to go. Somebody were to ask you, why are you a part of a church family? <laughs> what reasons would you give? What would you say? This next year, our church, Saddleback Church, which currently meets in many locations on four different continents, we're going to launch out into our most ambitious and loving outreach into our communities and into the whole world than we've ever attempted. It's gonna be an exciting adventure that I believe is gonna change all of our lives. But first, before we get into that new year and that new vision, we need to review who we are and what we are. We need to identify why we do what we do and what are the purposes of a church family. Now you need to have clearly in your mind this foundation. You need to know all of the ways that God wants to bless your life through your church family. So starting this weekend, I'm gonna teach you a brand new series that explains the five irreplaceable, exclusive benefits of being part of a church family. Now, these five benefits to your life are exclusive to the church. In other words, nothing else besides the church family can meet the five deepest needs in your life and provide the five essential benefits that a church provides. You can't get them anywhere else. They are only available through a church family. You can't get these benefits through your work or your school or your nation, or even your physical family. Only the church can meet your five deepest needs and help you fulfill God's five purposes for your life. Now that's a big claim, but in the next seven weeks, the next 48 days, I'm going to prove to you without a doubt that what I'm saying is true, that only your church family can meet the five deepest needs of your life, help you fulfill God's five purposes for your life. And I'm gonna be very practical and very, very specific. Now to fully benefit from this series, you're gonna to need to participate in five different parts of this series that we're starting this weekend. First, I need you to listen to all seven messages that I teach on the weekends and the days ahead. Second, you're gonna to need to watch or listen to a two minute daily video from me for the next 48 days. It's a two, only two minutes long. And if you'll give me your email or give me your text, I will mail you a link to this daily two minute video teaching by me, which is gonna amplify what I share with you on the weekend. Now third, I'm gonna ask you to post what I send to you in that link on social media, on your social media page so that others can benefit too, because helping others is a part of your own growth. Next, I'm gonna ask you to read a chapter uh, or two in my book, Purpose Driven Church, each week. Now, you may have, if you've been in class 101, you either have this or this. This is the original cover when we had a half a million sold. This is a, a, a later cover when we had over a million sold. This book is in 17 languages, 
purpose-driven church is the only book on the church to ever sell more than a million copies. And I'm going to take you deeper as you read chapters in this uh, book over the next 48 days. Finally, I wanna urge you to form a small group. If you're not already in one, and I want you to use the application and discussion questions that I give you on the weekends and in the daily video that I send you. What am I saying? This is gonna be an intensive immersion into learning how the right church family can support your right needs and the right purposes of your life. Now, all I wanna do today is give you a brief overview uh, of where we're going for the next seven weeks and to introduce where we're going to, uh, what we're gonna cover in the next 48 days. Now, the starting point is to ask this, what's a church? What is a church? How, how do you define it? How do you describe it? <laughs> when I say the word church, what do you think of? Now, depending on your background, your answer is going to vary, whether uh, you came of a Christian background or a non-Christian background or an atheist background or Buddhist or, you know, whatever, um, Muslim or whatever. But my guess is that your understanding of what a church really is, is probably pretty limited and not really all that God says that a church family is. So let me first tell you what a church is not. It's not a building. I mean, most of you, when you think of a church, you think of a church building on a location. I'm going to the church, which means a building. Jesus didn't die for a building. Churches meet in buildings, but they're not a building. Second, a church is not an institution, which is a misconception. We often think of the institutionalized church. Well, that can be out there, but that's not what a church is. It's not a building and it's not an institution. I want you to write this down, okay? Write this down in your outline. A church is not a place I go to, and it's not an event I attend. It is a spiritual family that I belong to. It's not a place I go to. It's not an event I attend. It's a spiritual family that I belong to. Now, there are many, many verses in the Bible that would teach this truth, but let me just look at one. Acts chapter two, verses 41 and 42, and down to verse 46, which is a clear description of the very first church, which was in Jerusalem. And here's what it says. Every one of these words that I tell you to circle is important. So please circle them, and then we'll come back and talk about it. To those who believed, circle the word believed. Those who believed, circle that, were baptized, circle that, believed, baptized, and added to the church. They joined, circle the word joined, so you got believed, baptized, joined. They joined with other believers and committed themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship. Circle teaching and circle fellowship. Teaching and fellowship. What's the apostles' teaching? It's the Bible and fellowship and the fellowship. It says they worshiped together, circle the word worship. They worshiped together regularly at the temple courts and they met in small groups, circle that, in homes for communion. You can underline or circle communion. And shared meals, I like this part, circle shared meals with great joy and thankfulness. Now notice these words, believed, baptized, joined, worshiped, fellowshiped, they ate together, uh, they, they ministered together, they served together, all these different things. According to the Bible, this verse and many others, here's the definition of a church. A church, I've written it there on your outline, a church is a group of baptized believers who've joined together in a commitment, notice the word commitment, I didn't have you circle that, who in, joined together in a commitment to help each other fulfill God's five purposes for their lives. That, friends, is a church. It's a group of baptized believers who've joined together for the purpose of helping each other fulfill God's purposes for their lives. The purpose of the church is to help you fulfill God's five purposes for your life. Now, we've talked in the past many times about the purpose-driven life, but in this series, we're gonna look at the purpose-driven church and why you need other people in your life to fulfill God's purposes. So the next question we need to ask is this, 
why is the church the most important group on earth? Some of you say, well, it is. Yeah, I'm sorry to tell you this if you don't know it, but it is. The church is the most important group on earth. You say, well, I, why would that be true? Well, let me give you a number of reasons for that. You might write these down. Number one, first reason it's the most important thing on earth is because the church is God's family. It is God's family. First Peter 1, 3, God has given us the privilege of being born again so that we're now members of God's own family. You become a part of the human race by being born into the world. You become a part of God's family by being born again into God's family. We are a part of God's family. Notice it says we're members of God's own family. Circle the word member. We're members of God's own family. You need to be a member of God's own family. Now, what is God's family? Well, 1 Timothy 3.5, 3.15 says this, NCV version, that family is the church. God's family is the church of the living God, the support and foundation of the truth. Here in California where we have earthquakes, we know the value of support and foundation. If you don't have good support, you don't have good foundation, you're gonna crumble when the earthquakes happen. And if you don't have a good support and good foundation for your life, the support and foundation of the truth, you're gonna crumble when the heat's on in your life. So the church is God's family. That's why it's more important than any business, any government, or anything else. It's God's family. Number two, it is the only reason God created the universe. Did you know that? The whole reason God created the universe is he wanted a family. God wanted a family, and that family is called the church. So the church is the reason God created the universe. If God hadn't wanted a family, if God hadn't wanted the church, None of this would exist. The Bible says God created the entire universe because he wanted the church. That's how important it is. Look at this verse from the Bible. Ephesians chapter one, verse four, living Bible. Long ago, even before he made the world, even before he made the world, this is before the universe, God chose us to be his very own through what Christ would do for us. Did you know that before God thought of the universe, he thought of you? That's how valuable you are. That's how important you are. That's how much you matter to God. Before he thought of the universe, he thought of you. Look at this verse, Ephesians 1, 5. His unchanging plan, God's unchanging plan, has always been from the very beginning of time to adopt us into his own family. God wanted a family. To adopt us into his own family by bringing us to himself through Jesus Christ. And this gave him great pleasure. So the church is God's family. God wanted a family. It's the whole reason he created the universe. That's how important the church is. If God didn't want a church, nothing else would exist. Number three, God is using his church for his eternal purposes. Ephesians 3, verse 10 in the Bible, verse 10 and 11 says this, God's intent, that's his intention, his purpose, was that now through the church, through the church, through the church, underline that, through the church, the manifold wisdom of God should be made known to all the rulers and authorities in the heavenly realms according to his eternal purpose, which was accomplished in Christ Jesus our Lord. I love the message paraphrase of this passage, Ephesians 3.10. It says this, through Christians like yourselves gathered in churches, this extraordinary plan of God is becoming known and talked about even among the angels. God's plan for all of time involves the church. No church, no universe, no time, no plan. Number four, fourth reason why the church is more important than any business, any school, any government, any nation. Jesus died for his church. He didn't die for your nation or my nation. He didn't die for your business. He died for the church. Ephesians 5, 25 and 27, Christ loved the church and gave himself for it. It's like the father dies for his family. The husband dies for his wife and kids. Christ loved the church, the bride of Christ, the body of Christ, the family of God, and he gave himself for it. He died so that he could give the church to himself like a bride in all of her beauty. And he died so that the church could become pure and without fault. You wanna know how something 
matters. You look at what somebody's willing to pay for it. When somebody's willing to give their life for something, that shows how much it's valuable. Christ died for the church. Number five, it's the only thing on earth that's going to last forever. Now think about this. Starbucks isn't going to last forever. McDonald's isn't going to last forever. Walmart isn't going to last forever. No corporation. Toyota Corporation isn't going to last forever. No nation's going to last forever. No business will last forever. The only thing that's going to last on earth right now that's live going to last forever is God's church. It's going to last forever. The Bible says this in Ephesians 3.21, glory will belong to God in his church and in Christ, in Christ Jesus. Notice, underline this, for all time and for all eternity. The church is going to last forever. Nothing on this planet's going to last except the church. That's how important it is. It is. First Thessalonians 3, 4, 17 talks about one day that when the second coming of Christ, then we'll be caught up together with him in the air, in the clouds, to meet the Lord in the air, and we will be with the Lord together forever. Well, that's, who's, who is that? Who's the we? The church. Number six. The church is the only group that Jesus said would succeed. In Matthew 16, verse 18, Jesus says this, I will build my church and all the powers of hell will not conquer it. Jesus is in the church building business. He's not interested in building my reputation. He's not interested in building your reputation. He's not in, interested in building nations. He's not interested in building uh, businesses. He's not interested in building clubs or organizations. He says, I'm gonna build my family. That's why I built the whole universe. I will build my church and all the powers of hell will not conquer it. Yes, there are battles. Yes, there are losses. Yes, there are things we don't win in. But I've read the last chapter of the Bible. We win. And ultimately, the church succeeds. It's the only thing that's going to last. Number seven, it is the only group big enough to solve global problems. You know, I've spoken before the United States Congress. I've spoken before the United Nations. I've spoken at TED conferences and Aspen Institute and Davos World Economic Forum. And I hear people talking about public and private partnerships. But you know what? The problem is they're not big enough to solve all the global problems. There's no nation big enough. There's no business big enough. The church is the only thing big enough to solve global problems. Let's put this in perspective. There are 2.2 billion church members in the world. That means the church is bigger than China. The church is bigger than India and China put together. And the Bible says in Ephesians 3.20 in the New Living Translation, by his mighty power at work within us, the church, he is able to accomplish infinitely more than we had ever dared to ask or hope. All of the global problems cannot be solved without one third of the world who happen to be members of churches. We have the greatest distribution, we have the most volunteers, and on it with highest motivation, love, and on and on. Let me give you one other reason why we're going to do this series. Because the greatest privilege in life, listen, the greatest privilege in life is to be a part of God's church. To say, I'm a member of God's family. I'm a child of God. That's more important than your nationality or your gender or your business or anything else. The greatest privilege in life is to say, I'm a part of God's family. 1 Peter 1, 3 says it like this. God has given us the privilege, the privilege, circle that. This is the greatest privilege. God has given us the privilege of being born again so that we're now members of God's own family. Circle the word members again, member and circle the word family. God has given us the privilege to be a member of his family. 1 Corinthians 3, 16. Do you realize, don't you realize that all of you together are the temple of God? and the Spirit of God lives in you? I said this earlier, but I wanna say it again. When you were born physically, you were immediately born into the human family. You became a part of the human race. You didn't have a choice. The moment you were physically born, you became a part of the human race. Once you're born physically, you're in that human race. But when you are gonna be a part of God's family, that's choice, and you've gotta choose to let Christ come into your life. And when you're born spiritually, reborn, born again, rejuvenated, new life, then you're born into God's family. And that's choice. I don't know if you've made that choice or not. 
You're in the human race. You're created by God, you're loved by God, but you're not in God's family unless you've asked him to be a part of his family and accept Christ as your savior. Now, you say, well, okay, Rick, I get it. I, church is not something we go to. It's not an event, it's not a building, it's family that I belong to, and you just gave me eight reasons why it's more important than anything else on the planet. Well, the next question that comes up is, what's a purpose-driven church? You've heard that around Saddleback any length of time. What is a purpose-driven church? Well, if you were to look up the word drive in a dictionary, you would find that the word drive means to guide or to control or to direct to guide, to control, or direct. When you drive a car, you guide, control, direct it down the street. When, when you drive a nail into the wood with a hammer, you guide, control, direct the nail into the wood. When you drive a golf ball, hopefully you guide, control, direct it down the fairway and onto the green. Drive means to guide, to control, or direct. Every organization, every business, every nation, and every church is driven by something, guided, controlled, or directed. I've listed a few things there in your outline. Some churches are driven by tradition, and some organizations are driven by tradition. How do you know you're a tradition-driven church? They have the favorite phrase is, we've always done it that way. Some churches and some organizations are driven by personality. And the question then is, what does the key leader want? And the problem with the personality-driven church is when the leader dies, or retires, or has a moral failure, or whatever, burns out, uh, then the church is left floundering. And we've all seen that happen to a lot of churches. Uh, we don't want a personality-driven church. Some churches and some businesses are driven by finances. And, and when you have a finance-driven church, the question is, how much will it cost? And you ask that. Some churches are driven by programs. And you, you look at the schedule of a typical church and they've got programs for Sunday school and programs for women, programs for men and programs for the choir and programs for children and on and on and on. And you get the whole idea that the purpose of the church is just to keep people busy, to keep Christians busy in meetings. Jesus did not say, I've come that you might have meetings. He said, I've come that you might have life. Some churches are actually driven by their buildings. I think it was Winston Churchill who said, we shape our buildings and then they shape us. One of the reasons why Saddleback went 15 years without a building. We wanted to prove to the world, you don't have to have a building to grow a church. This church grew to over 10,000 in attendance, in a tent. We didn't even have a building. Why? We wanted to prove that a church is not a building. We moved so many dozens and dozens of times in the first 15 years of our church before we finally built a building. And then some churches are actually driven by events. Keep the calendar full of activities. But at Saddleback Church, we call ourselves a purpose-driven church. Not tradition-driven, events-driven, you know, money-driven, you know, ego-driven, personality-driven. No, not a guilt-driven, not a fear-driven church, but a purpose-driven church. Why? Well, we base it on this verse, Proverbs 19, 21, which says this. Many are the plans in a man's heart, but it is the Lord's purposes that prevail or last eternally. What does that verse say? I can make all kinds of plans, but they're not gonna last. The only thing that's really gonna last is to have a solid purpose of God that says his plans are eternal. His plans last forever. His plans prevail. His purposes are gonna be going on forever and ever and ever. And we're gonna look at these in detail for our church family in the days ahead. Uh, now, all of this has just been an introduction, but I don't wanna leave you without giving you a short list of some of the many, many benefits of belonging to a church family. So let's just wrap this up by giving you five benefits of being a part of a church family, of belonging, not just attending, but belonging. Say, that's my family. You can always tell the difference between an attender and a member. When an attender comes up to me in the grocery store, they say, Pastor Rick, I love your church, your church. But when a member comes up to me and say, Pastor Rick, I love our church. Have you made that hop? Have you made that switch from consumer to contributor, from attender to member, from longing to belonging? Let me give you five of the many benefits. We'll look at dozens of these in the days ahead. But why don't you write down these five? Number one, 
A church family helps me focus on God. A church family helps me focus on God. You know that. Is it easy to lose your focus on God? Yes. Is it easy to get distracted by details and distractions and disturbances and dead ends and delays and difficulties? Yes. And about every few days, I need to get my focus refocused. Uh, and, and coming together as a church family helps me focus on God. And the Bible says, seek first the kingdom of God, all these other things will be added to you. So if I focus on God, the bigger God gets in my mind, the smaller my problems are. The bigger I see my problems, the smaller God is. So I, I refocus on God. Number two, a church family not only helps me focus on God, it helps me face life's problems. You know, it, it helps a whole lot to know that other people are in the fight with you. That, that you're not alone, that you're not by yourself, that you're, you're not a lone ranger. Let me just get real personal. You ever get discouraged? Of course you do. Why? Because life is tough. Life is tough. Life is a series of problems. And some of you have this myth in your mind that one day I'm gonna get it all together and then I'll have no more problems and no more stress and no more tension, no more anxiety, no more stress the rest of my life. I hate to tell you this, but you're gonna have stress the rest of your life. Because life is a series of problems. It's how you build character. You're right now in one of three positions. Either you just came out of a problem, or you're in the middle of a problem right now, or you're headed into the next one, because life is a series of problems. But God never meant for you to go through life and all those problems and all that stress on your own. See, the life that God intends for you, a purpose-driven life, is never a solo act. God never meant for you to have to handle all this stress, all this anxiety, questions, problems, doubts, fears by yourself. He built a support group of people around you. It's a spiritual family, and we call that fellowship. It's part of the purpose of the church for your life. So number one, God helps me to, to focus my, my faith. It helps me to, to face my problems. Number three, a church family will help me fortify fortify my faith. Now, do you know what fortify means? It means to strengthen. It means to develop. It means to reinforce or, or to make stronger. And, and what happens is when you get with other people in God's family, you, you set up your right values, you get the right support, it helps you establish your priorities, it helps you decide what's trivial, uh, uh, what's really important. It helps you fortify your faith. It clarifies your values. You know, this, you know this is true. There's a lot of phony baloney ideas out there in the world today. There's a lot of stuff on, on, on the radio and on the TV and on the internet and on social media. It's just not true. It's not just fake news. There's fake everything. And, and if you don't have a fortified faith, if you don't stand for something, you're going to fall for anything. You know that. So it helps you fortify your faith. Number four, a church family helps me find my place to make a difference. Helps me find my place to make a difference. You have a desire to aspire. You have a need to succeed. You and I weren't put on this earth just to use up resources, to take up space, to breathe air, and, and then to die. God has a significant purpose for your life. It's called your life mission for each of, your, of our lives. And, and God has something unique for you to do. He has a ministry in the church and a mission in the world and he wants you to make a contribution with your life. He didn't want you to just be a consumer your whole life. He wants you to make a difference. He wants you to leave a legacy. He wants you to learn how to serve God by serving others, how to make a difference with your life. The best way to learn how to do that is in a church family. Are you gonna learn that at business? No. You're gonna learn that at school? No. You're gonna learn that in a neighborhood? No. Now, let me just say this. When we get to heaven and, and, we, we, and, and, and we're standing there before God, God's going to ask a couple questions. The first question that God's going to ask you is, this is the most important question in life. What did you do with my son, Jesus Christ? I hope you know the answer to that. I accepted him, his, his life into my life. I accepted his grace, his forgiveness. I trusted him with my life. I repented and turned to him. But there's a second question that's just as important. After he says, what did you do with my son, Jesus? 
And by the way, he's not going to ask, what was your denomination? What was my son? What did you do with my son, Jesus? Then he's going to ask, what did you do with what I gave you? That is the question of the stewardship of your life. How did you use your life to serve others, to make a difference, to give back, to make a contribution? The first question determines our eternal destiny, but the second question actually determines our eternal rewards. And part of my job as your pastor and part of our church's job as a family is to get you ready for that final exam. Finally, there's a fifth re thing, a benefit. And that is a church family helps me fulfill my life mission. Not just how you serve others, but you were put on earth to make a difference that no one else can make. Have you thought about that? That God put, it, 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 God doesn't need one of us uh, two of us, he only needs one of us. God put you here specifically for a unique life mission that no one else can fulfill. I can't fulfill it. Nobody else can fulfill it. And if you don't fulfill your life mission, guess what? It's not gonna get done. And we're gonna talk about that in the days ahead. Now I realize this is just a little taste of where I'm gonna take you in the next 48 days. As I said, we've studied the purpose-driven life before, but in this series, we're gonna look at how you need a purpose-driven church to meet all of your five deepest needs. We're gonna look at each of your five deepest needs and how to fulfill your life purposes. Now, every week, I'm gonna give you some homework assignments. And this week, I want you to do three things. Okay, you ready? First, I want you to get a copy of this book. The Purpose Driven Church, either the, the original cover or the new cover. And I want you to read the first two chapters of Purpose Driven Church. Now, if you wanna sneak ahead and read other chapters, that's okay. But I'm just asking you to just read the first two chapters this week. By the way, uh, those of you who have been through Class 101 know that we give a free copy of this in every Class 101. And it just so happens this weekend, we're teaching class 101 at all of our campuses. So if you go to um, class 101 this weekend, which is called Discovering Your Spiritual Family, you'll get a free copy of this anyway, and you don't have to go out and buy it uh, out at the bookstore table at your campus. So that's first thing, read the first two chapters of Purpose Driven Church. Second, give me your email or text. Everybody take out a card right now Take out a card, write your name on it, and give me your email. If you don't give anything else, give me your email. Or if you don't get email, you do texting, give me your text uh, number, and I can send you a link to my daily two-minute videos that I'm gonna share with you every single day for the next 48 days. This is gonna be like a spiritual B12 shot in your arm every day. Number three, I want you to form a small group of two or three people, if you're not already in one. Most of you are already in one. Uh, we have over 8,400 small groups at our church. But if you're not in one yet, we'll help you. You can go out to one of the tables, a small group table, say, I wanna form a group, just get a couple of friends and say, we're gonna discuss the application questions that I send you every weekend. Uh, and then you can uh, do those in your small group this week. Finally, if you're not already a member of Saddleback Church, let me just say this, look right at me. We want you. We, we, we don't just accept you in this church, we want you. We want you in our church family. We want you to be, we will love you, we will serve you, we will care for you, we will help you, we will stand with you, we will support you. I invite you to take class 101, which is called Discovering My Spiritual Family, this Sunday afternoon at all of our campuses. Now I've just given you a glimpse of where we're going. We're gonna look at your five deepest needs and how only the church, the family of God, can meet those needs in your life in the days ahead. Read the book, listen to the daily devotional, the, or watch the daily video, and be here every weekend. And bring a friend. And by the way, when you get that link, pass it on to somebody else on your social media. Let me pray for you. Heavenly Father, I thank you for our church family, 
I love everybody who's here. We come from every different background. We represent every different age group, every ethnic group, nationality. We represent different 67, 70 different languages. We represent different economic strata and background and even political differences. But we all come together in this family called Saddleback, a purpose-driven church, that we might learn what you wanna do through your family. Help us to realize that this is the greatest privilege of life. There is no greater privilege than to be a part of your family. If you've never invited Jesus Christ into your life, if you've never stepped across the line, you're not a part of his family, but you can start today. Will you take this step? Just say in your heart, Jesus Christ, just say these words, Jesus Christ in your mind, I wanna be a part of your family. I, I wanna live forever in heaven, but I wanna know you and I, and I wanna be a part of your family and I, I want to see how my needs can be met by your family and I wanna fulfill your five purposes for my life. So today I'm saying yes to you as simply as I know how. And I humbly ask this in your name, Jesus, amen. God bless you, everybody. I hope you're as excited about this series as I am. It's gonna take us right up to Christmas season. Then we'll go into the magical season of Christmas, but don't miss a single week. God bless you, everybody. Thanks for checking out this message on YouTube. My name is Jay and I'm Saddleback's online pastor. I wanna invite you to take your next step by checking out our online community or help get you connected to a local Saddleback campus. Three things we have to offer you right now. First, learn more about belonging to a church family by taking class 101. Second, don't live life alone and get into community with others by joining an online small group or a local home group in your area. Third, Join our Facebook group to be more engaged with our online community throughout the week. Take your next step and learn where a local campus is near you by visiting saddleback.com online or email online at saddleback.com. Hope to hear from you soon.